Today we're going to be going over the basic flight instruments that you'll find inside the cockpit of most small general aviation airplanes, your basic six pack, and everything else that you see on the panel. So for starters we're going to go ahead and go over our basic six pack and unfortunately that's not a six pack of beer, it's the six pack instruments that we use in the airplane, the six most common instruments we're going to be referring to. So we'll go ahead and start off in the top left corner here with our airspeed indicator and just as its name is, it indicates the airspeed of the aircraft, the speed through the air, not the speed over the ground. So this is airspeed. In fact, you could be stationary on the ground on the runway with a really strong headwind, maybe say like a 50 mile an hour headwind blowing at you, and the airspeed indicator would indicate 50 miles per hour because you have wind flowing over the airplane at 50 miles per hour, even though the airplane is still on the ground. So airspeed indicator indicates our airspeed through the air. The next instrument in the middle here is our directional gyro, our DG. Now the directional gyro has something to do with our direction, you guessed it, yep. And it's a gyro instrument, so it looks a lot like a compass. You might think it's a compass, but it's not a magnetic compass. It doesn't work magnetically, it works with a gyro. And we actually reference our magnetic compass before we take off and set our directional gyro to that same heading to align them. And then the directional gyro, for the most part, will indicate the proper heading. It needs to be reset every so often during flight. But the reason why we use this, not just strictly a magnetic compass, you'll see when you take your first flight lesson, that magnetic compass bounces around a whole lot. This thing remains pretty rigid in space because it's a gyro and that's what gyros do. So it gives us a very good stable indication as to what our heading of the aircraft is. The next instrument here on the right is our attitude indicator and it does exactly what its name is. It indicates the attitude of the aircraft. It'll indicate nose up, nose down. So you'll see blue sky if your nose up or black or brown when your nose down. And then of course it'll indicate your bank angle left and right. So the general attitude of the aircraft is the aircraft nose up, nose down, or banked left or right. So that's our first three parts of the six pack. Now on the Piper Cherokee, it's a little different. We don't have the six pack laid out exactly like you do in a lot of other GA aircraft, but some of these older Cherokees have some of the six pack kind of shoved off to the bottom left there. So we'll go ahead and come down to the very bottom instrument, and that is our turn coordinator. The turn coordinator also has a slip skid indicator in it. That's that ball sliding back and forth. That basically tells us what rudder to step on. We always say step on the ball. When that ball slides off to the right, it looks like it's floating around like in a little level almost. If it slides off to the right, you'll press on the right rudder. Slides off to the left, you'd press on the left rudder and then the ball would go back to the center. Now the little miniature airplane in there also indicates bank, left or right, and rate of turn. It's a turn coordinator, so it helps us coordinate the turn via rudder and it helps us determine how quickly we're making that turn, showing us our rate of turn. It's also a gyro instrument, but that gyro instrument happens to be powered electronically, so it's not sensitive to the vacuum system on the aircraft, and if you did lose the vacuum pump, you wouldn't lose the turn coordinator for bank information. It's powered electronically. Conversely, if you lost power to the aircraft, the other gyro instruments would continue to operate normally because they run off the engine driven vacuum pump, not electricity. So next six pack instrument over here on the far left, that is our VSI, vertical speed indicator. It does just that. It indicates our vertical speed up or down. How fast are you going vertically? We know with our airspeed indicator, how fast we're going forward through the air, but how fast are we going up in the air? Are we going up at 100 feet a minute, 500 feet a minute, 1000 feet a minute? Are we going down at 500 feet a minute? And that's what the vertical speed indicator tells us. It works off the static source, much like the uh, airspeed indicator does. However, the airspeed indicator uses the static source and the pitot tube or pitot vane together. So that's a twofold instrument, whereas the VSI works strictly off the static source or static port. The next instrument in our six pack is the altimeter. The altimeter works strictly off the static port or static source in the aircraft. And the difference between a static port and a static source, well, that's just basically the static source. It could be a static port. It could, it's wherever the little hole is on the airplane that gives you ambient air pressure. So the ambient air pressure tells the VSI basically if it's climbing or descending, and the ambient air pressure tells the altimeter how high it is. So the altimeter is going to dictate our height or tell us what our height is. 
and it's kind of a neat little instrument. We'll look at an indication here. As it spins around, much like a clock, we have this narrow hand that indicates our hundreds of feet. We have this thicker hand that indicates thousands. We have this really skinny one that moves real slowly and indicates ten thousands, and we won't see that used very much uh, because for the most part, uh, we don't fly really much above 10, 12,000 feet almost ever. Um, especially in Florida, we'll be hanging down around four or five, maybe 6,000 during flight training, but really nothing higher than that. So that includes our six basic instruments. Now, let's just go ahead and look at a few other instruments that are in this airplane to help make sense of everything on this panel. Over on the far left corner here, we have a compass. That's a magnetic compass. It doesn't rely on electricity or vacuum from the engine or anything like that. It's magnetic. As long as the Earth has a magnetic pole, it's going to continue to work until 2012, but that's already behind us. So we don't have to worry about it. The magnetic compass is going to work. So, other things that we see here. Communication radios. Well, up here, this first one is a communications radio and a nav radio. Right below it is a GPS unit, and right below that is a transponder. We'll talk more about those in later lessons. Coming down to the middle here is our throttle. We have a little brake handle over here on the left on the Piper Cherokee. A lot of airplanes have tow brakes. The Piper Cherokee has tow brakes and this little brake handle right in the middle there. And so we've got our throttle. Over to the right here we have a mixture control. Oftentimes those are always located near the center of the airplane so both the pilot and co-pilot could reach them. And then of course you have dual controls. You have your yoke on the left and right sides here. And then the last instrument, so to speak, that we really have uh, on the left side there is our VOR and the VOR is used for navigation and we'll talk much more about that when we can get into flight planning and actually going somewhere in our airplane to a further away airport. Coming back over to the right side we have a few instruments that are of importance to the pilot and oftentimes are mounted over on the right because they're slightly less important maybe than the six pack but still important for the pilot to keep in their scan or keep glancing over at every so often. We have our fuel gauges we have our oil pressure, we have our oil temperature, our amperage, our amp meter telling us how much amps our alternator is making. Are we charging the battery or is the alternator not working and are we discharging the battery and going to run out of power at some point? Down below that, since we're in a lowing airplane, we have a fuel pressure gauge. Many lowing airplanes have fuel pressure gauges. Since the fuel is below the engine, we have to pump it up to the engine. On uh, high-wing airplanes, like a Cessna 150 maybe, it's common not to see a fuel pressure gauge because it's simply gravity-fed to the engine since the wing is above the engine and the fuel's in the wing. Fuel's above the engine, it just kind of gravity feeds on down. Then, our last instrument here we'll talk about is the tachometer. So, tachometer is much like the tachometer on your car. It's an RPM gauge, and that's just telling you how fast the engine's turning. It's also how fast the propeller is turning because the propeller is mounted directly to the engine. So you may wonder why your car tachometer goes up to 5,000 RPM and our airplane tachometers usually only go up to 2,500 or 3,000. Well, our airplane engines turn a lot less RPM than a car engine does. And the reason is we have a big old propeller and believe it or not, the tips of the propeller would be going so quickly since they're further away from the center, they'd be going so quick at high RPMs that they would go supersonic and it would cause vibrations in the propeller. So although the center hub of the propeller may not be moving that quickly, the tips, since they're further away, they have to cover a greater distance every rotation, they move very, very quickly. And that's why we're often limited to 2,500 or 2,700 RPM in many general aviation airplanes. That pretty much sums up the instruments in, that we're going to be going over for the cockpit for our basic understanding here. Each airplane's a little different, but this will give you a great introduction into most of the airplanes you'll be seeing throughout your flight training career. If you have any other questions about your own specific aircraft, definitely sit down with your CFI and spend an hour or two sitting in the cockpit asking him, what's this? What's that? Point to anything you don't know and let them explain to you what it is, how it works, and why it's important to you as a pilot. Also, what happens when it breaks or what might make it break or stop working? So what are the failure modes of the different pieces of equipment in the cockpit? It makes a great hour or two lesson, especially on a rainy or windy day when you can't go fly otherwise.